Hello everyone, I'm Mrs Jennison and I'm an Associate Director for Outward Grange Academies Trust. Welcome to our lesson on atoms and beyond and today we will be looking at atoms and the periodic table. Before we start, it would be really useful if you had a copy of your planner present with you at the moment so that you could have it open on the periodic table. It would also be a really good time to turn off any notifications on your phone so that you're not getting distracted. And if you had a piece of paper and a pen available, you can work through the activities with us during the video. Our challenge for today's lesson is to be able to define the terms atom and element. Our aspire is to be able to describe how scientific ideas change over time and how the periodic table is arranged. So we're going to start our lesson in ancient Greece with a scientist called Democritus. He believed that matter is composed of indivisible building blocks and this idea was recorded as early as the 5th century BC by Democritus. He called these particles a tomos. Democritus proposed that different types and combinations of these particles were responsible for various forms of matter. However, during this time, there was other ideas pre present. Another ancient Greek philosopher at this time had a very different idea, and that, that philosopher was Aristotle. He did not believe in the atomic theory that Democritus was promoting, and instead taught his own theory. He thought that all material on Earth were not made of atoms, but of the four elements, Earth, fire, water and air. He believed that all substances were made out of small amounts of these four, what he called, elements of matter. Now, at the time, we've got to remember there was very limited technology and the idea of earth, fire, water and air was easy for people to believe in because those four, as he termed them, elements are visible and you can see their presence on earth. According to Aristotle, he, everything was made out of those four elements. Democritus' theory actually explained things much better, but Aristotle was more influential, so it was his ideas that went forward through time. We had to wait almost 2,000 years before scientists came around to seeing the atom in the same way Democritus did. Now, your first task this lesson, I'd like you to outline the theory that each of those scientists had. And it might be a good idea to present your information in a table like the one on the screen. So you may have something like Democritus said that matter was indivisible blocks, he called them atomos, and it was different combinations that made the different forms of matter. Aristotle said matter was made out of four elements, earth, wind, water and fire, 
And again, it was different combinations of those elements which was responsible for the different forms of matter. So now that you look at these in a table, you can see that there's some very big differences. However, there is something in common. They both believe that what they termed atoms or elements and it, as different combinations were making the different forms of matter. So now let's start to look at how this idea developed further through time. So John Dalton is the main scientist credited with atomic theory. However, there was many other scientists that contributed to this and revisited it over time. Some of them quite famous, like Galileo, Newton, Boyle and Lavoisier. In 1661, Boyle presented a discussion of atoms in his publication, The Skeptical Chemist. However, it is the English chemist and meteorologist John Dalton that was credited with the first modern atomic theory and he explained it in his publication, A New System of Chemical Philosophy. Now Dalton carried out experiments and it was his experiments with gases that led to some of the earliest measurements of atomic masses and a concept of atomic structure and reactivity. His atomic theory contained three main ideas. All atoms of a given element are identical. Atoms of different elements vary in mass and size. And atoms are indestructible. Chemical reactions may result in their rearrangement, but not their creation or their destruction. So now that we've gone over Dalton's work, um, I'd like you to answer a couple of questions on it. What were Dalton's three ideas about atoms? And what did Dalton have to ensure that his theories were believed? So Dalton's three ideas were all atoms of a given element are identical, they vary in mass and size, and atoms are indestructible. Chemical reactions result in their rearrangement, but not their creation or destruction. To ensure his theories are believed, Dalton's findings were actually supported by evidence, and that is fundamental in science that evidence is provided when theories are changed. And he found his evidence from his experiments with gases. So what do we know now? We still use the term atom. An atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist on its own. Atoms of each element are represented by their own chemical symbol, which would either be a capital letter or two letters, one capital and one lowercase. Now the origin of the word atom is still rooted in that ancient Greek, where it came from the term not to cut, which meant indivisible in their language. As we can see, that word developed over time until it was shortened to the word atom. Now, we do use the word element still. However, now it has a very different meaning because it is linked to what we now know about atoms. So a substance that is made of only one sort of atom is called an element. 
Atoms are actually made up of three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons and electrons. Now, we can see an atom on the screen at the moment. This is a representation of a carbon atom. In the central section, what we call the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. And for a carbon atom, there are six protons and six neutrons. Orbiting that nucleus is the electrons and they are arranged in what we call shells. Each atom is made up of a different combination of these three subatomic particles. Any atom of an element will have the same number of protons. However, it may vary in its number of neutrons. This is where our modern theory differs from Dalton's. Atoms are, of an element are not identical, but they do have the same number of protons. We will look into this and the history of the atom in much more detail later on in your studies as we move towards GCSE content. Now, just for a little bit of fun, I'm going to insert a song here that sings about the atoms and I just think it's a bit interesting. So please listen to it still and then we're going to move on to the periodic table. Atoms are the basic building blocks of all matter They're extremely small, make up everything in our universe Stars, these bananas, our entire body All made of tiny atoms fit together differently Atoms are made up of three particles called Electrons, protons, and neutrons Electrons are the smallest, their charge is negative Spinning really fast all around the nucleus The protons positive and located in the center Form in the nucleus with neutrons that have no charge And when particles amass different, makes various elements One proton, one electron, the simplest atoms hydrogen Every element has its own atomic number Tells us how many protons located in its center Less protons means less mass Like hydrogen that's a gas It's less dense in the air One proton in the nucleus Because protons have a strong positive charge Push each other away But pull back with a strong nuclear force Balance makes atoms possible Everything in the universe Different atoms pump together Are known as molecules So let's just recap our outcomes for today. We should pretty much have met the challenge outcome now. We should be able to define the key terms, atom and element. And we are working on our aspire outcome at the moment. We did look at this a little bit when we looked at the development of the atom. But we're going to look at it in more detail now as we start to look at the periodic table and how it is arranged. So, just a little bit of a warm-up activity to start us thinking about this process. Um, on the screen, there are some squares. Each square has a colour and a number. Now, I just want you to think, how would you, if you were given these as cards, how would you arrange these squares? Well, there's a few ways we could, we could group them by colour. So that's our first choice. We can also put them in number order. Now actually when we put them in number order in rows of four, until 14, the colours match in the columns. We could put them in colours, columns of colour and in number order. And that way we've still got an increase in number order, but we're also matching the columns into colour. Now, this is a little bit like the work of the early scientists. The early scientists who started to try and arrange elements knew pretty much two things about those elements. They knew their atomic weight, which we now refer to as atomic mass, but they did use the term weight back then. And they knew properties of that element. And I've represented that by the colours in this exercise. Now, if they grouped them just by colour, the weights wouldn't match up. And if they grouped them just by weights, the colours wouldn't react up. So, so they wouldn't have the same reactivity in columns. 
So now we're going to start to look at some of the work of some of our early scientists on this periodic table and how they overcome some of these issues. Now early scientists found themselves in a similar position to the one you were in then. They wanted to find an order to the elements and they wanted a way to categorise the elements and make them go in an order because that's how scientists work. We like things to be in order. They knew very little about the elements and this is where they had some difficulties comparing what they knew to what we know now. And actually they were working with an incomplete set as not all of the elements had been discovered yet. We're going to look at the work of two of these scientists and the first one will be up on the next slide. And that is Newland. Now, Newland was actually a musician, he was a keen piano player, and um, he went with a different law, which was the law of octaves. And he said, if you order the elements by their atomic weight, then every eight elements you would get a similar property. And that was a little bit like the second time when we put them in rows of four and then increased the mass, and, and sometimes it didn't quite fit with our properties. So that was Newland's octaves. Now, then we have our third scientist. So we've got Mendeleev. Now, Mendeleev ordered... So now that we've looked at the work of two of these scientists, I'd like you to have a go at completing the sentences on the screen. I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. So the early periodic tables were incomplete and some elements were placed in inappropriate groups if the strict order of atomic weights was followed. Mendeleev overcame some of these problems by leaving gaps for elements that he thought had not been discovered and in some places changed the order based on atomic weights. Elements with properties predicted by Mendeleev were discovered and filled the gaps. And it's point three that led to Mendeleev's work being more widely accepted. Hi everyone, this is the periodic table of elements and this is the particular one that you would receive in an exam. Now what I'm going to do in this video is I'm just going to annotate this with some really key features that would help you in using it. So the first key feature is the key in the middle. Now the key tells us what every single number and symbol represents on this table. Now in that you can see that we've got the atomic proton number which is the bottom number on each element and it is the lower number. Then we've got the atomic mass. Now the proton number is the number of protons and the relative atomic mass is the mass of the nucleus. So it is the number of protons 
added to the number of neutrons. If we look at the periodic table, we can see that there are some patterns to its arrangement. So the first thing is that it is arranged in order of increasing atomic number, which means every time we go across, the element gains one proton. So arranged, this is the first way it's arranged, increasing atomic number. The second way it is arranged is to do with the groups. Now the groups are the columns in the periodic table. And what the groups represent is the number of electrons in the outer shell of that element. So every element in group one will have one electron in its outer shell. Every, ele every element in group four will have four electrons in its outer shell. The next thing we need to know about is the periods. Now the periods represents the number of shells that each element has. So if we looked at helium, helium's got two electrons and only one shell because it's in the first period. Neon has got 10 electrons, two in the first shell and then eight in the second shell because it's in the second period. Argon has got 18 electrons, two, then eight. Then another eight. So dependent on an element's location in that periodic table, we can find out pretty quickly how many electrons that element has and how they are arranged. So if I just pick one at random now, beryllium. Beryllium is two rows down, so there are two shells. And it's in group two, so the second shell will have two electrons. So beryllium would have two electrons, then another two. Now, there are a few other things we need to know when we are using our periodic table. And the first thing is a quick way to figure out where our metals and our non-metals are. So if we find aluminium and we draw like a staircase going around aluminium all the way down to the bottom of that periodic table, Typically, anything on the left of that would be metal. And anything on the right of that would be a non-metal. There are just a couple of specific groups that we need to know about now. So group one is our alkali metals. Group two is the alkali earth metals. This middle block is the transition metals. Group seven is the halogens. And group zero is the noble gases. Remember that group zero is unreactive because it has a full outer electron shell. So there we go. That's our annotated periodic table. So using what I've just gone through, I'd like you to explain why the periodic table is arranged in a certain way and include a description of groups and periods in your answer.
Elements are arranged from left to right and top to bottom in order of increasing to atomic number, or you could have said in order of increasing number of protons. The rows are called periods. These elements have the same number of electron shells. And the columns are called groups. The elements in these groups have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. Now that's everything from me this lesson and I will see you soon.